139 verse 23 to 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That's our prayer this morning, God.
what's up, friends and family? Welcome to Emmanuel Reformed Church's online service. My name is Clark Corver. I'm excited to be with you today. Uh, before we dive into Daniel chapter 2, got a couple of things for you. First and foremost, you can check out the QR code on the screen. Uh, if you have a smartphone, you can take a picture of that. And that will lead you to a number of things. A place you can input prayer requests. You can find more information about the groups that are happening at Emmanuel. Uh, you can also put your tithes and offerings in there uh, via our website or the app. Um, but today we have actually something special. If you keep watching the screen, we have a tithes and offerings video. We have a family from our church that is going to testify um, to the joy and life they experience as they partner with God on His mission. Check it out. I just feel my whole family's been blessed by Emmanuel. Uh, it started off, you know, Krista and I attending couples class mm -hmm. and really just being edified, you know, by other Christian couples. Uh, she found uh, Women's Walk and I found my men's group. Mm -hmm. uh, the kids, you know, attend Kids Club and now, you know, they're attending Edge. And just feel that, you know, there's, Emmanuel offers so many opportunities, you know, for us to dive in and really just be a part of this big family where we're all on the same path and the same journey together, um, you know, following the Lord. So we began giving here and there because we knew it was the right thing to do. But as we started um, learning about the Lord and we started to shift as we saw his blessings and we began to have the conversation and, about our finances and uh, tithing that 10% and never looking back with um, all of our income. Giving us an opportunity to just be thankful and grateful and um, to really see the Lord's blessing upon our life and what, how we can be that light to others um, I think it's that's what it's shown us, just that piece of our side that we can give to others. Uh, so I think now that we've been given uh, more faithfully in our finances, I think now the Lord is, is really tugging on our heart and showing us different ways that we can uh, give back. Uh, so, you know, like our time. You know, uh, you know, Krista is volunteering in the nursery. Uh, we have also, you know, done a couple years in Kids Club volunteering as leaders there. And, you know, I think, you know, the, the bless, uh, being blessed to be a blessing um, really kind of resonates, you know, with us just because, like, we feel so blessed. We feel, you know, so much of the abundance of God uh, that, you know, we want to give back. And we, you know, really looking for opportunities, you know, to give back. The word that comes to my mind is, is to pray. And, you know, I know that, you know, sounds cliche, but, you know, that's the first thing that we do. Uh, every time you know our check hits the the bank account is to stop and pray and just to be thankful to the Lord you know thank you for these jobs and thank you for an opportunity to um, provide for our family uh, thank you for your provision Lord uh, because you know your provision is great and uh, we're just just grateful and thankful and we, we give back to you wholeheartedly and I think I think giving, wholeheartedly is the key. Yes. I think my advice would be still in the Lord and see how you are led. All right, Emmanuel. Now it's on you guys. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, let's give together and give with joy and give with a full heart. Super grateful for the Ramos family and grateful for you as you and I get a partner and what God has called us to do. Now for today, we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 2, and I want to begin by telling you a, a fable. I've shared this fable a couple years ago, but I want to share it with you again. The fable goes like this. There was once a farmer who was well-to-do, and he had this son 
who was the apple of his eye. His son had a white stallion, and one day the son forgot to shut the gate, and the stallion ran away. Neighbors came up to the man and said, what bad luck you have. The man said, good luck, bad luck. What do I know about these things? But get this, the next day that white stallion returned with 12 other stallions. The neighbors came and looked at him and go, what good luck you have. And the old man said, good luck, bad luck. What do I know about these things? Meanwhile, the next day, the son's now taking care of all these stallions. One of them bucks him off, and he breaks his leg. Neighbor comes up to him, and you can guess what he said. What bad luck you have. Good luck or bad luck? What do I know about these things? The following day, the emperor shows up and starts recruiting all the boys in town to go to a war, a war that many of them don't want to go to. The son can't go because he has a broken leg, and you can guess what the neighbor said. What good luck you have. Good luck or bad luck, what do I know about these things? You know, for you and me, oftentimes we look at the circumstances and the happenings of the world and we think, maybe this is luck. Maybe this is just a coincidence. Maybe this is just how life is. But for the Christian, when you and I read the Bible, you see a common theme from Genesis to Revelation that God is in control. This word is sovereign. It means that God is in control and he has a plan. So for today's scripture reading, we're actually not going to read anything from Daniel 2 quite yet. I want to start in Genesis and go through Revelation, the key parts of scripture, and I want to highlight a number of passages that talk about God as creator, God as sustainer, God as sovereign. Here we go. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jumping ahead to the end of Genesis, Joseph had then been betrayed by his brothers, was later reunited by the grace of God, and he said... Which you intended to harm me, God intended it for good, to accomplish what's now being done, the saving of many lives. After Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, you fast forward and you get to the Psalms, you get to King David, and this is what he writes in Psalm 115. He says, our God is in heaven, and he does whatever pleases him. And then David's son, Solomon, writes the Proverbs, and he says, in the Lord's hand, the king's heart is a stream of water that he channels toward all who please him, meaning God's guiding and directing the leaders of our world. After this, um, God's people are sent into captivity because they were disobedient and did not want to follow God. So the prophet Isaiah says this, After years of being patient with his people living in sin, God withdrew his blessing from them and sent them into captivity. The Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah and said, I form light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and I have created disaster. I, the Lord, do these things. Now you fast forward and after 400 years of waiting, Jesus Christ comes. And it's in his mission, his telling of the kingdom of God and why he's come, he continues this theme of God's got a plan and God's in control. In John 6, Jesus explains to his disciples his plan. And in the midst of humanity's decision to betray God has enabled people to respond to a beautiful yet challenging message of the gospel. In John 6, he says, There are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. After Jesus then died, resurrected, and ascended, Peter is standing before a crowd preaching his first sermon, and he again picks up on the control and the plan of God. He says, this man, Jesus, he was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. After Peter comes another man named Paul, who writes a number of the letters that make up the New Testament, Right away in Ephesians 1, he reminds us that in him, in God, we are chosen, having been predestined according to a plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. He writes to the church in Rome and he says, despite life's hardships, God is working for our good. He's working out a better plan than we could have ever imagined. So in Romans 8, he says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And then you get to the very end of the Bible, Revelation, and it ends just like it begins, and this is what it says. The creator God, ruling over all, one day we will join with the angels and declare, God, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and by your will they were created 
and have their being. People of God, these are the words of God. Thanks be to God. So as you jump into Daniel 2, I want you to have in the back of your mind a theme of the entire scripture is God's sovereign. He's got a plan and he is in control. Now what happens in Daniel 2 is King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that has totally thrown him. And he calls all the enchanters and the magicians to him, and he says, I want you to interpret my dream. But how it worked in Babylon was they would tell the dream, and then the magicians and enchanters who are supposed to be so wise and have this magic power from these quote-unquote gods would interpret it. But Nebuchadnezzar's caught on to their games and their tricks. He's like, I'm not going to tell you my dream. If you really have the power of the gods, you can tell me what I dreamt. And obviously they can't. They can't tell him what he dreamt because he didn't tell them. So they, they tell him, like, we're not able to do this for you. And he says, I'm going to kill every single one of the wise men, the magicians, and the enchanters in all of Babylon unless somebody can interpret this dream for me. Enter Daniel. Enter Daniel. This is what he says in chapter t- or verses 12 and 13. This all made the king so angry and furious that then he orders the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. You see, up to this point, what's been happening is King Nebuchadnezzar has taken Daniel and his friends. He's stripped them of their identity, at least so he thought. Uh, He's placed them in his courts. They're studying astrology and all these things. Through Babylon University, he's trying to enforce himself, his will, and the Babylonian culture over these young men. And now he said, I'm going to kill you if you cannot answer my question. And tell me what my dream was. So you put yourself in the shoes of Daniel right now. You're remembering God's in control, but you're literally about to get your head cut off. You're about to get killed. What would you do? Now, if I'm Daniel and you're thinking, well, I guess there's a temptation to rely on Babylon University and all the education and training we've learned here. There's another temptation to go, hey, give me a second. Like, squirrel, what's that? And then run the other way. Get your bed sheets and knot them together. Get out the window and just run. Like, when crisis hits, what's Daniel going to do? When crisis hits, what do you do? When everything goes wrong in life, your day that was planned, down the tubes, and the bottom falls out. Like, you've been there. I know you have. I've been there, too, often. This is how this is happening right now. How do you respond? How do you respond? I was thinking just a couple months back, uh, I was getting ready to take a big trip to Vermont. I was going to go hang out with a number of really influential and gifted preachers from the world and just kind of learn from them, spend some time with them. And right before I'm about to leave, like hours before, my wife can't find her phone. And just so you know, we've got five little kids at home. We've lost Bobby's phone for a day and a half once, to which we're looking all over the house. We're doing the Apple ID. We're pinging it, and we can't hear it. But it says it's at our house, to which we eventually think we should ask our youngest kid where it is. So we ask him, like, oh, mom's phone? Oh, yeah, I put it in my my purse and then put it in my treasure chest in the tub in my closet under my clothes so I'm like oh my goodness where's this phone at because I'm gone if Bobby needs help she's got to call somebody she orders the groceries on there she's got birthday presents she's trying to track and get to people at the same time if something happens there's who's she gonna call and you could just feel the anxiety ramping up I'm about to head to LAX to fly to Boston and what are we gonna do And my kids are getting anxious trying to figure this out. I remember Bobby calling Apple and Apple not being able to help us. And a switch flipped. I think in my wife's heart and mind, she realized God's in control. We're going to be okay. We'll make ends meet. We'll have food. And when she came out and she brought this peace with her, she had prayed and consulted the Lord. There was a peace that came from her to our family. And we were all like, okay. We're going to figure this out. It's going to be all right. We eventually found the phone. But naturally, when crisis hits, you just want to call Apple. You want to figure it out. You want to accuse people. You want to try to figure everything out and fix it yourself. And instead of pausing for a moment, even for a silly lost phone, go, God, would you be in this moment, be in my parenting, be in my anxiety, be in my frustration? Where is this thing? Hopefully it's not at the bottom of the pool or you know, broken in my kid's closet. Where is it? Because when you and I go back to the scriptures and you have your moments of crisis or your hardships, the difficult circumstances you're in right now, you know, how do you respond? You and I have to respond remembering that God is sovereign, that God's in control. 
in our relationships, in our finances, in our occupations. Because what happens then now in Daniel, the scripture says he pleads to God. You can say he prayed to God. He sought the Lord. He didn't jump out the window and head for the desert on his camel saying, I got to get out of here. He didn't rely on Babylon University. He consulted God. When the hard times came, Daniel remembered there's a God who's in control. I'm going to consult him and ask him, what should I do in this situation? And this is what happens. After God then meets Daniel in the middle of the night as he's about to lose his life, Daniel is told the dream. And he praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of the God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and I praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. And you have made known to us the dream of the king. You see, when crisis mode hit and the pressure was applied, Daniel sought prayer and praise. When the pressure hit, he was like, I'm going to pray and I'm going to praise. And that's something you and I got to remember. When crisis hits, when hard times come, when trials and tribulations are there, we're not going to consult Apple. We're not going to consult our parents first or our spouse or our best friend or Google or Wikipedia or YouTube. Sometimes when your heart starts beating, you just got to pause and say, God, you're here. (laughs) Might be a little thing. Might be a big thing. You're in control. You're with me. We'll find our way Daniel responded to pressure with prayer and praise. And the other thing that happens when you combine prayer and praise, you get perspective. (laughs) You get perspective because sometimes I get so focused on this little thing that's happening in my life, I don't see anything else. I forget anybody else is in the room. I forget God is present, the God who made me, who made the trees, who created everything. It actually has a plan. And he's working through the joys, the celebrations, and the losses and the hardships. I got to start by going to the Lord. Prayer and praise give us perspective. That's what we need to do. Daniel's focus is not on his circumstances. It's on God. It's on his character. It's on his nature. It's on who God is. It's on what God has done. You see, one of the most popular commands in Scripture is don't be afraid. And as you think about your life right now, I think about mine, whether it's something as silly as losing a phone or losing a loved one or having to find a new job or a new house, God constantly reminds his people and he reminds you and me, Sovereign, he's in control. Don't be afraid. And you know, after that, one of the most popular commands is remember. Remember. Remember who God is. Remember what God has done. So for Daniel, as he is in that room being told by Arioch, you're supposed to be put to death right now. I need to kill you. I'm sure he remembered creation. I'm sure he remembered the times of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I'm sure he remembered the stories of Joseph. I'm sure he remembered King David fighting King Saul and the Philistines and all the other surrounding countries that came after him. He he remembered these things. He remembered who God was. And that allowed him prayer to praise, have perspective and know there's a God who's in control right now. For me, I think about my life. I think about, you know, God's, you know, ordained destiny in my life to ministry. I think about his call the first time I experienced the Holy Spirit as a little boy in Emmanuel's patio. I I hold on to that. I remember times where, you know, my family lost their car. My dad lost his job. We were wondering what we're supposed to do. We're living in this old junky rental, a couple hundred bucks a month. And then God meeting us in that, my dad getting a job at a construction company for $10 an hour. And then after a year of that, getting a dog, a house, a car, and a job in like 72 hours. I remember what God did there. I remember the times I lost loved ones and God just met me in my pain. I remember the vows I gave my wife and how God met us in that celebration. I remember God meeting me and my wife and my kids last couple of years. I remember God being faithful in and through his church as we near the century mark. These are the things that I have to remember when crisis hits, when hard times come, when the pressure's applied. I need to pray. I need to praise. God will give me perspective. The God's who control. He's going to help us find our way because God alone controls the human affairs and kind of what's happening in the world. So as you think about it for you, like what do you need to remember when the hard times hit? 
right in the middle of that passage we just read, this is what it says. It says, God, he changes times and season. He deposes of kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. That's verse 21. See, there's a temptation. When you and I think about like God's being in control and him electing leaders and controlling kind of what's happening in the world, there's two opposite errors you know we can make one is to like get too involved in political processes especially as daniel is an advisor to a political leader the king nebuchadnezzar the opposite error we can make is to say god's got everything in control shoot i'm gonna sit on my hands sit on my couch you got this god you don't need me but what daniel does is daniel acknowledges god is in control and has a plan and yet he also accepts his responsibility because daniel knows who he is and he knows who god is and so Daniel finds an opportunity where he is able to exert his influence in exile, in a culture that doesn't care about God, to bring glory and honor to God. This is Daniel's chance to, to step up and step in. So God has given him the vision. He told him what the king's dream was about. Now is his chance. Now, if Daniel's flesh was rearing, what happens in the dream is basically he is told, he's going to tell the king that his kingdom is going to fall. This is Daniel's chance to, to zing him and go, you took me away from my home. You invaded my homeland. You killed my family. You're making me learn all this stuff. You stripped my identity, all kinds of other things. You're going to lose. Ha! But look at how Daniel responds. In verses 27 and 28, Daniel comes to the king, and after he has received this, he says, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he's asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what's going to happen in the days to come. You see, Daniel just stood up and delivered a hard truth to the most powerful man in the world. He gave God glory and honor. He was kind and respectful to someone who he probably could consider an enemy. And he's seeking God's glory in the midst of a hard time. Now, when it comes to the dream... If you're reading along in the scripture on your own, what happens in the dream is there is this big statue. And the statue is made of different minerals and components. The top of it, the head, is gold. And then the silver is the breastplate and the arms. And then there's a bronze belly and thighs and the legs are iron. What this resembles is the, are the different nations and countries that are going to be in ruling power over the known world at the time. So the head is Babylon. The silver is made of Persia. The bronze is Greece and the iron legs are Rome. You see, what, what's happening, if you look at the picture right here, is as the, the dream continues, this large rock is cut from the, the, the hillside, the mountain, but it's not cut by, by the hands of man, and it comes in and destroys it. This is what it says in verses 34 and 35. In this dream, while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This is in the middle of Daniel where the gospel is ringing true and clear. Because what he's saying, essentially, my translation is, earthly kingdoms are going to rise and fall. If you look at, at America's timeline, I was doing this this week, looking at America's timeline compared to like Britain and the Ottoman Empire and Russia. And then you can go back to Babylon, Assyria, and Egypt. We're young. I don't know if life is going to stay as it is here forever. If history tells us one thing, it's, we're not going to stay in power forever until, until Jesus Christ comes back. There, the Lord allows empires to rise and then also to fall. And it's in that God's the one who's going to come and break down these pagan, idolatrous countries and say, I'm going to get glory. Money is not ruler. There's no president or prime minister or dictator that is the ultimate ruler. It comes down to God. And that rock was cut not by human hands, but cut by God. So when you look at that, this rock cut by God comes and smashes the earthly kingdoms. God's going to have the everlasting kingdom. He's the one who's in control. And that rock, when you read this within the context of the Bible, that rock is Christ. <laughs> On Christ, the solid rock I stand. On Christ, the cornerstone, the foundation. There's so many scriptures and songs and hymns that point to this is Jesus Christ. 
an empire and a kingdom is going to come from God that's going to be different than what the world has to offer and is going to destroy the ways of this world and only the kingdom of God is going to be left standing. God's in control. He's got a plan. Jesus is coming. Now, our problem, our problem, the tension lies in the sovereignty of God and God having plan and God having control is in the pain of the world. Like, why would God allow these things to happen? And you can think through examples in your life. I know you can. Will you question and wonder, God, where are you? Are you here? What's happening? Then what happens, the temptation is for our felt experience to become the most important thing in our life. And your experience matters. Our emotions are important, but they cannot be the final say. Think about Daniel, if his felt experience was the final word. He got stripped of his family. His identity is taken. You know, for those high up in the king's court, many of them were castrated, like I said last week. The scriptures don't tell us that, but church history does. And now you're in the enemy zone, not only for a couple years, but for the rest of your life. If, if Daniel's felt experience was the final say, then good luck. But you see, God meets us in the midst of our pain, in the midst of God. If you're good, how could you allow this to happen? God, why did you allow my loved one to die? I think about Jessica Moore's testimony from Christmas Eve. If you haven't watched it, it was phenomenal. Jessica talked about in the midst of Lyme disease, in the midst of financial hardship, in the midst of familial you know, ups and downs, all these things. She just looked at God and trusted him and trusted his word, that he is protecting her, that he was with her. That was inspiring to me. Like, God, you promised to protect us and you're preparing us for holiness, to become like you, to become the people you create us to be, to use us as a light in this dark world and to exert our influence, right, in a culture that doesn't care about God. Give us conviction, God. And of all these things, I want to remind you this, that rock that was cut out at Jesus Christ, he's not immune from the pain and the hardship in this world. So oftentimes that, that thing that seems to cut the legs out of God's control and sovereignty is how could a good God allow this to happen? God willingly entered into the pain and the brokenness himself. I think about the prophet Isaiah as he quotes from Isaiah 53 that this Messiah, Jesus, is going to come and after the world gets done with him, he's going to have a face people can't even look at so broken. He's despised by men, rejected by everybody around him. He's going to experience suffering and pain. He's going to be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, but it's by his wounds. We're going to be healed. It's like, God, you're in control. There's this beautiful mystery. My emotions are up and down. But like Daniel, I'm going to trust, God, that you're the hero of the story. That in the midst of the political upheaval and exile and culture, I'm not going to be reactive to it because I know who I am and I know who you are. I'm on mission. I'm going in. And if I get a chance to exert my influence for the good of those people around me and ultimately to glorify God, I'm swinging for the fences. And I believe that's what God wants to do in your life. He's the hero of the story. When pressure comes, let's turn to praise and prayer. Say, God, how can I glorify you in this relationship, in this situation, in this crisis, in this hard time? And what's so amazing as this story ends is King Nebuchadnezzar's blown away. He's going, what? How do you know? How do you know my dream? Clearly, this God must be real. And this is what he says. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel, and he paid him honor. And he ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. And the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery to me. So you have a king who's on his face and on his knees declaring that the real God is the real God, not Baal, Yahweh, Daniel's God. Now, as you and I know, this rock that's going to come and destroy empires and establish an everlasting kingdom that's going to be mountainous, it comes from Jesus Christ. It's the kingdom of God. This is what Philippians tells us. This is how we're going to end our time. One day, this is what we're going to say, Therefore God's exalted Jesus to the highest place and has gave him a name that's above every name. And it's at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One time, one day, every knee will hit the ground, every tongue will confess, just like King Nebuchadnezzar's did. 
Every president, prime minister, dictator, civilian, man, woman, boy, and girl will profess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. God's in control. He's got a plan. He wants to use you right where you're at to bring glory to his name. So here are the questions I want to leave you with. First is this. How is God inviting you to exert your influence for good? And are there any difficult circumstances in your life right now that God can get glory in? The second thing is this. Next time, the hard times hit. Remember, prayer plus praise equals perspective. Create a reminder in your phone on a note that God is, in fact, in control. Let me pray for you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for this chance to worship. We thank you for your word from Daniel 2. I thank you for the interpretations of dreams and visions that and when a hardship hit and Daniel's life was on the line, Lord, he didn't consult Babylon education. He didn't run for the hills. He consulted you, God. He, prayer, he prayed and he praised. I pray that we would do the same. He'd be glory, glorified in our life. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All right, my friends, thanks for worshiping with us today. I pray God met you in Daniel 2. If you're open to it, would you open up your hand? I'll give you a blessing, and then we'll end with the doxology. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn the countenance of his face towards you and give you his peace. God bless you. God for